By now you probably know the Cleveland Browns. Believe Land. Believe Land. Off to their best start since 2004 after a 21-21 tie with Pittsburgh on Sunday, which is the most Hugh Jackson thing, the most Cleveland Browns thing ever. I'm Colby, that's Bracky, and this is Bootleg. On today's show, we will take a look back at the week in college football as well as the first week of the NFL season. We're also going to look ahead to week three of the college football season. We'll talk some NFL, talk some fantasy like we do. Uh, And last week, my producer Efren informed me that the show was one big run on sentence. So this week, we have segments. So we'll actually do some of that. Um, But Bracky, do you remember the hitch quote I gave you last week? I don't. (sighs) Sad. You can't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. And this time... I remember now. We we were in Shreveport. We were. Lovely Shreveport. The battle on the border. Uh, During a tropical depression, I learned today. (laughs) Was that what it was? That's what they said. I was depressed. (laughs) It wasn't tropical. Uh, First of all, (laughs) all due respect to the battle on the border, I would just like to go on record as saying that it is truly one of my favorite events that we do. Um, Love the Independence Bowl. Love it more when the bathrooms are working and the elevator works. But nonetheless, love the Independence Bowl. It's a great venue for high school football. And they do a really good job of getting an excellent collection of talent, good teams in there every year. Last year, we loved the teams that we were able to cover, the players we were were able to cover. And this year really was more of the same. Um, I guess I could do a quick recap before we we dive into it. it. Um, I did make a list because I'm a list guy. JT Curtis won his 400,000th football game. It is unreal. Like when you open up uh, the press guide they give you Mm -hmm. and you just see like 564 and like four. And it is like, how many years did it take him to get 500 wins in high school football? Uh, Well, he's 71. Okay. So he's been coaching for 50 years. So divide that. Yeah. And that I don't know. He looks good for 71. He looks better at 71 than I look at, at 31. <laughs> he's moving up and down the sidelines. I spent most of that game on their sideline, and he's moving. Yeah, yeah. J- JT Curtis is a man. Um, it was actually his 571st <laughs> victory, um, most among active high school coaches. He's, a, I think we said, what, three to four years away from yeah. the all-time record regardless. Uh, and so, yeah, John Curtis Christian knocked off Bishop, Bishop Lynch. Don't I'm going to be in so much trouble. Don't mess it up. They are the Friars. To be clear, the Bishop Lynch Friars. My wife is an alum, so I have nothing but respect for the Bishop Lynch Friars. Absolutely. Uh, A team that went undefeated last year before they lost to St. Pius the 10th. Not to be confused with St. Pius X, which is not a thing. Right. So shout out to JT Curtis for his whatever, four millionth win. And shout out to the Friars for playing their hearts out, played a great game. It looked like they were going to get run out of the building early. You know, it's 21 nothing. Uh, John Curtis is going in for another touchdown. Mm -hmm. And then Play Wyatt, who stood out the whole game. Your boy. Yeah, he was awesome. Three-star safety. He's got a few offers, but maybe he'll get some more offers after after this game. He goes 100 yards. Yeah, they called it 99 at the game, though. And I'm never going to understand how they got – are you you not allowed to call it 100? I don't know. He picked the ball up in the end zone. The ball was in the end zone. He was in the end zone. Yeah. It's 100 yards. I believe it was 100 yards as well. So – um, yeah, play Wyatt. I don't know why they don't play him on offense. Right. Because I feel like he was the best athlete in that game, and he actually had more yards off punt returns than any player except for one wide receiver. He had 33 punt return yards, which is not a lot, but 33 yards. They had a wide receiver with 36 yards. He's the only player on the offense, the only skilled player on the offense with more yardage than play Wyatt on punt returns alone. Um, and if you figure in the 100 yard. Yeah, you need to there. get him the ball yeah. more. He was balling. His name's Play for a reason. Definitely. P L A E. That's that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> McGill Tulin lost to West Monroe. Uh, this one's gonna have you real fired up though, so let's come back to it. Okay. 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 Uh, North Little Rock ran all over what was a pretty good Evangel defense. Yeah. Uh, your boy in the middle of that Evangel defense, whose name escapes me. And based on the look on your face, I think it probably escapes you, too. Yeah, it does. Anyway, he's really good. And, uh, yeah, North Little Rock 
we all know about Oscar Attaway, but Tyler Day had, I can't imagine he's had a better game than that in his high school career. Um, well over 100 yards rushing, three touchdowns. I tried to interview him after the game, and he's like the most humble person yeah. on earth. It's like annoying. I had to like <laughs> brag on him for him because he wouldn't do it. But um, Tyler Day balled out, and North Little Rock was fun to watch. I'm not used to North Little Rock being good at football because back in my day, uh, they were not. And Little Rock Central was like the Little Rock team that you were afraid of. So Bracky told me North Little Rock was... You were shocked. You were like, what are you talking about? I know. I, I didn't pay enough I attention. I thought I was wrong for a minute. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I guess they finished last year ranked seventh on Max Preps. I completely slept through that. I, <laughs> I didn't know that at all. So, um, But they looked the part of the best team in Arkansas. And I'm glad that they did because the other team from Arkansas that I am used to being pretty good is Bentonville. And they got smacked by Alito. Uh, Alito's phenomenal super impressed with the Lido playmakers all over the field really good defense ranked number one texas 5a right now and they should be jace mcclellan has a really unique combination of strength and speed that I, you don't see a lot i mean you can look at his his 24 7 profile and know he's good at football mm -hmm. but when you see him up close benville was putting seven and eight guys in the box on every play to try to take him away and, I mean, I guess they did because he didn't rush for 100 yards, which for him is rare, but he had a very casual 88 at five and a half yards of carry. I so. thought you kind of described it perfectly. He just he doesn't go down. Like, the first guy, he either makes a miss or he bounces off. Runs him. through him, yeah. yeah. You're never The first tackler never tackles him, yeah. um, which was bad news for Bentonville because the first tackler was, was hitting him usually at the line of scrimmage mm -hmm. or, you know, a yard or two downfield. Um, they didn't have this stat at the game, but I would love to know what his yards after contact were. Because, I, I mean, look, I don't know, but I'm guessing 15 carries, probably 50 to 60 yards after yep. contact would be Absolutely. my guess. Um, also opened the door for a monster game from my man Jake Bishop, yeah. the quarterback in Alito. He was fun. Jake is a ball player. Yeah. He's, uh, he's vertically challenged a little bit, which I can relate to, and I think that's the only reason that he's not sitting here right now with 10 to 12 offers. He, he was really impressive. Yep. And... Um, him being impressive was also good news for JoJo Earl. Yes. JoJo's a sophomore. He does now have a 24-7 profile. They literally took his picture for that after we saw the game. It, yeah. yeah, we saw it happening, and then we saw the profile later. But yeah, like <laughs> 10 minutes later. So good job, 24-7, getting that up in a hurry. Uh, JoJo Earl is not a big guy, but he is a guy that I expect to be a three- or a four-star prospect and um, a total game-breaker. Yeah, really shifty guy. Um, we saw him take a little screen pass to the house. Uh, we saw him uh, just take the top off the defense and run by everybody and score a touchdown. Well, arguably his best play of the day, Bracky had on camera yes. phenomenal yes. camera work by you, and uh, sadly it got flagged and called. Yeah, uh, I hate officials because they ruined my great shots. <laughs> that was like the third time that weekend. Uh, I had like the best shot I ever had uh, in the Evangel game get called back. So Sad. just keep your flags in your pockets, guys. Yeah, we're trying, to, we're trying to make content out here, and you guys are messing <laughs> it up for we're us. We're not there to watch you. Uh, Horn Lake, Mississippi. Blew out Booker T. Washington, which I know Booker T. Washington, every year they're supposed to be really good. Every year they disappoint me. Um, they just always seem really disorganized. They have a lot of talent, mm -hmm. but um, the organization never seems to be there. They never got Dax Hill involved, <clears throat> and Horn Lake defensively, Unbelievable, and yeah. I think majority of that is because of Nicobe Dean. Absolutely, but I mean, as a unit, they—I I forget the stat. I should have actually prepared for this podcast a little better, and I would actually have this number. But um, I want to say it was like negative thirty-one rushing yards in the first half. That is Booker unreal. T. Uh, go ahead. No, they, like you said, Booger T has talent. You know, they they had Dax Hill out there a few times on offense, uh, and they just had him run go routes. And obviously Horn Lake was keyed in on him and was not going to let that happen. And well, then you have four-star wide receiver Jevy and Hester who touches the ball one time. Yeah, and when, I realize Dax is fast. Sure, I'd like to have him run by the corner and throw deep balls yeah. all night or all day too, but you didn't have time. Right, yeah, that's I another mean, thing too. I mean, their quarterback was never actually going to finish a five-step right. drop, so you're never actually going to be able to throw that yeah. deep ball. So it didn't matter how many times Hester and Hill were wide open behind corners. And they were a handful of times. You're not going to be able to get on the ball right. with that defensive front coming after you. Um, Nicobe Dean is not the 15th best player in the country. <laughs> you cannot make me believe it. There's not 14 guys better than him. Um, I'm not going to like list off players that are not better than him, but I've seen a good number of 
the top 15 just in the last couple of months, whether it be at the opening or wherever, and 14 of those guys are not better than Nicobe Dean. He may be the best high school linebacker I've ever seen. There was, he literally did it in every aspect of the game. You know, from the first snap, he's he's uh, the pursuit too that we saw. Mm-hmm. Hester was going to score on the one touch he had. Yeah, and Nicobe Dean trips him up. He gets a sack, uh, and then out of nowhere, he decides to play Wildcat quarterback. Yeah, and houses it from 50 yards, scored another touchdown. That shot you did get. Yeah, I did. That one was perfect, right at me. Um, I mean, just. Every every aspect of the game, he was impressive. Yep, he he was awesome. Uh, Ray Darius Jones, the quarterback at Horn Lake, also looked a lot like a guy that should be a four star prospect. Yeah, I just no one knows where he's gonna play in college. He's playing quarterback in Horn Lake. He's not playing defense at all, and but he probably translates better a little better as a defensive back in mm-hmm. college. So I realize it's kind of a hard comp, but I somebody with that type of athleticism. Give them to me. I'll put them somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Get, so I think I think that he will get that fourth star before all is said and done, based on a couple like of conversations uh, yeah. I had. Sound like he might have been getting bumped up. Yeah. Um, okay. Segment alert. <laughs> Free smoke is what we're calling this. Uh, it. It's going to be the time that we dedicate to beefs that we have with assorted players. Oh, speaking players. of beefs, did we want to weigh in on McGill Tolan real quick? That's where we're going. Oh, okay, okay. Way ahead okay. of you, Bracken. Sorry, sorry. I Don't worry. Yeah, I, I knew you'd be so fired up about it that I dedicated a segment to <laughs> what is about <laughs> to happen. I thought this was Khalil Tate segment. Nope, not, not the Khalil <laughs> Tate yet, although, I, yeah, I probably should direct a little ire at Kevin Sumlin as well. That's a tease. Right in due there. time. Yeah. In due time. Uh, yeah, so what was it? A minute to go. Up by seven. Second down. West Monroe has just used their last timeout. High school play clock is 25 seconds. High school referees are really, really bad at spotting the ball. It takes them a long time. Forever. Yeah. Even if they magically were awesome at it for two plays, you're only looking at like a five to seven second differential between the play clock and the the game clock Mm -hmm. on fourth down. So you might have to punt it, but even if you do have to punt it, just quick kick that thing out of there and they're going to have maybe one play maybe and i mean this is like if everything goes absolutely perfectly for west monroe all mcgill tulin had to do is take three knees take three knees it's over just uh you and i were standing there (laughs) behind the play and we're talking about who we're going to interview from from McGill Tulin? Yeah, Sheldon Layman. Sorry, man. Yeah, I was coming for you. Hell he had game. a great game. Yeah, he was very impressive. Um, Memphis got a good one there, um, and then and we had just complimented the back too, like not too long no. before that. We looked it up. He's got an offer from Southern Miss, and then the miracle on the border. We're miracle calling on the it. border. Uh, also known as the dumbest thing I've seen on a football field yes, this year. Yes, don't even put the running back in that situation. They ran off tackle, too. Right. It, yeah. They ran like ISO. Right. And just like, you know, a three yards cloud of dust. They tried to stretch it out. It was literally like the miracle at the Meadowlands, you know, when Herm Edwards scooped that ball. Oh, yeah. It was It wow. was like that. He gets stripped. That's a great reference from about 35 years ago. Thank you. I was alive for that. Um, he gets stripped <laughs> and then goes right into the arms of defensive back. See ya. Right and bias. you knew, yes. And I, I was so pissed because I wasn't filming because take a knee. And I thought they were going to take a knee. I know. And uh, so then it goes to overtime. And you knew what was going to happen in yeah. overtime. It was over. Right. That, that, that fumble return for a touchdown was the game-winning play. Yep. Overtime was just a technicality. Yep. Also, they played overtime on the West Monroe end of the field where the West Monroe band did the most obnoxious thing I've ever heard a band do in my See, whole life. See, that's why I, I mentioned to Colby when we were at the Freedom Bowl that it is a rule in West Virginia you cannot the band cannot play during plays and that is exactly why they just made noise whatever instrument they were playing they just yeah. played it as loud as they could it wasn't a song they no. just blew into their trumpet the, or whatever yeah that's see that's why yeah and uh, I don't know if it affected McGill Tolan well it couldn't have helped him no absolutely not I mean <laughs> no absolutely not um, but yes you should not be able to do that no no. So, um, yeah, that, w- that was so stupid that I was in my feelings for, like, the next hour. Yeah. I didn't come back from that until about midway through the North Little Rock game. Yeah. I was, I was upset. They kept us there much longer than we needed to be. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so also speaking of dumb things that happened on a football field, this segment, Bracky, is called Catfished. Okay. Catfished is a player or a coach that we thought we knew what they were. Yes. 
but they aren't who we thought they were, and we're not going to let them off the hook. We should not let them off the hook. We're not going to ever, <laughs> and this week is no exception. Uh, two by Denny Green. Arizona. I, I'm not even going to say Khalil Tate because I don't know. I haven't seen Khalil <laughs> Tate this year. If anybody's seen him, let him know that Arizona has another game, I think, on Saturday. But what are they doing? He's questionable for that game, so he could be gone. It right. might not be him. Right, the ankle injury, which, yes. which I will mention. Um, I don't know what Arizona's doing offensively. It's really frustrating to watch because they have a transcendent college talent in Khalil Tate. Is Khalil Tate an NFL quarterback? Probably not. Is Khalil Tate a pocket passer that should throw 45 times against Houston? No. Khalil Tate carried the ball seven times for eight yards on exactly three designed quarterback runs against Houston. One week after Kevin Sumlin admitted his error in trying to run a whatever offense that he and Noel Mazzoni are trying to run with this guy, the blueprint's already there. Rich Rod already showed you how to succeed with this guy, and they're trying to reinvent the wheel. I don't get it. And offensively, they're just inept. Um, speaking of the ankle, Sumlin said post game that the ankle injury was the reason they went away from the game plan they had originally. Mm-hmm. Well, Khalil Tate, post game, was asked about the same ankle injury, and he said, quote, We still stuck to the game plan. So they either did or they didn't stick to the game plan. I would, I would tend to believe that Khalil Tate would know whether or not he was going to be used for design QB runs throughout the game. I don't know. Game plan sucks. And it's ruining the Khalil Tate experience for all of us, and I'm very upset about it. Um, When this job was open, when they were looking who they should hire, uh, Ken Niamatololo was like the leading candidate. Uh And Khalil tweeted, I didn't come to Arizona to run the triple option. Maybe you should have run the triple option. Maybe you should have run the triple option because it allows you to run. Yeah. And does what you're really good at. Yeah. So that's one thing. Um, He also did not go to Arizona to be a pocket passer. No. So he's, as I mean, and he shouldn't be doing this in the first place. Like you said, Kevin, someone should not be trying to reinvent the wheel with uh, Khalil Tate. Um, He's barely completing fifty percent of his passes. He has one touchdown, two interceptions. And like you said, through two games, has attempted 79 passes. Oh, my God. 79. And he only has 22 rushing yards on 15 attempts. I would be surprised, and I, don't, I have no idea, but I would be surprised <clears throat> if there was more than one three-game stretch last year where he com- attempted that many passes. Yeah. It I, makes no sense. Um, you know how many rushing yards he had in his first start, two starts last year? Tell me. 578. Mm-hmm. And how many does he have this year? 22. That seems suboptimal. Yeah. That doesn't feel good to me. No, no, not at all. So, yeah, we were. <laughs> I, I was wrong about Arizona. I'm not, I oh, wasn't I mean, wrong about Khalil Tate. Khalil Tate's still a beast. I, he's just not being utilized at all. And Arizona looks like a train wreck. It's not good. Uh, like you said, I think Arizona catfished a lot of people. Because you give Kevin Sumlin a quarterback like Khalil Tate, and he has a resume of being very successful. Yeah. And there's talent on that Arizona team. And they were down like 31 to nothing to Houston. Early. At, yeah. Early. Yeah. I think what needs to happen for Sumlin and for the sake of Khalil Tate is I think that Texas Tech needs to go ahead and throw in the towel with Cliff Kingsbury and move on from him, make him available and we'll have the never-before-seen mid-season coaching hire at Arizona. Sumlin can bring Kingsbury back, okay. and Kingsbury can run his Johnny Manziel offense because apparently Kevin Sumlin had nothing to do with the Johnny Manziel <laughs> offense. I would, lo- I would love to see that. That'd be great, right? Yeah. Good theater. Right. Texas Tech, work with us. Seth Luttrell is waiting for you anyway, so it's fine. Let's make it all happen. Okay, I'm going to get on the phone, see if I can push <laughs> that through. I don't know if Cliff will love the idea, but... Yeah, college football, Cliff. Sometimes you got to put the sport ahead of yourself, man. Yeah, the college football needs Do it you. for the fans. Mm-hmm. Um, let's keep talking some college football. Yeah. Each week since the inception of Flow Football, uh, we've done a thing called the Cover Four, mm-hmm. which you know basically is just a really clever name that you know uses a term that's frequently used in the sport of football and also in gambling. So shout out to me for thinking of that. And um, then Bracky came aboard the football ship. 
And the cover four is going to suck a lot less now because it's not just me and my stupid <laughs> ideas. Now we actually have a whole process of like talking through who we like, who we don't like. Um, the conversations at the good old Holiday Inn in Shreveport last week Shout were out. phenomenal. Um, it wasn't necessarily reflected in the cover four on Flow because we kind of chose the wrong four, but I chose eight as part of a round robin parlay, and I'm proud to say that I went five for eight. So happens I that went, the three that I missed were all in the of course, the, in, in, of course, <laughs> in the cover four. But Bracky, you, I went you four and one. Me. Yeah, four and one. Yeah, so we just need to do a better job of choosing the ones we want to put in the article, I guess. Right. So that's what we're going to use this time for. <laughs> we're going to bring that conversation to life now like here it. at this table, and uh, try to decide how not to suck at gambling this week. <laughs> um, actually, though, before I, we get to that, I I did want to talk just um just random thoughts I have on a few teams. Okay. First of all, um, Oklahoma, who has beaten or damn near beaten massive spreads through the first two weeks of the season, looks like the best offense in the country again, yep. despite not having Baker Mayfield. Kyler Murray looks like a Heisman Trophy contender. Mm-hmm. And I think it's pretty safe to say that OU is the – with due respect to West Virginia, I think, it's, I think OU is the clear front runner in the Big 12. I agree. However – the Rodney Anderson knee injury might change things for them a little bit. Do you feel differently about Oklahoma without Anderson in the backfield? Obviously, I would feel more confident in them in them if he was in the backfield, but I still I don't think it's significant enough to be like, okay, then we got to drop him. West Virginia is a clear favorite or mm-hmm. TCU. They still have a ton of playmakers. Uh, there's a lot of talent that has experience behind Anderson that's going to step up now. Mm-hmm. And uh, – you still have a ton of playmakers, a wide receiver, and uh, Kyler Murray is still your quarterback. So it, Massive. While it, while Massive it, win. It hurts, and you feel awful for him. It's his third season-ending injury, <laughs> yep. and it's awful because he, he's an amazing player. Um, I don't think it changes their Big 12 or playoff chances. A year ago, before Rodney Anderson like really came on as being the back that we know him as today, he got off to kind of a slow start, and it was it was Trey Sermon mm-hmm. who was carrying the load for OU offensively for the first few weeks, and it looked like Trey Sermon was about to be the next great Oklahoma running back. Well, Trey's still there, so if he can find some of that, yeah, you know. But also T.J. Pledger, four-star true freshman, um, who's been used, you know, quite a bit through two games, especially on Saturday after mm-hmm. Rodney went out. I think those two, if they are who I think they are, and they don't end up in catfished. Uh, I think OU's fine. And I don't want to underplay the Rodney Anderson injury, but I I just think that Oklahoma is in the desirable spot where they have so much talent in that backfield behind him that if there is a program in a country other than Alabama or Georgia that can survive an injury like Rodney Anderson, it's Oklahoma. They're becoming a program where, as like Nick Saban liked to say, they just crap out another player. They, they do. Um, they do. So yeah, they have the talent there. That they're gonna next next man up, and they're not gonna miss much of anything. Okay, you heard it here first, Kyle Brack. You just said that OU is gonna win the Big Twelve championship, <laughs> and that West Virginia is not that good. Uh, Ohio oh, State boy. is Ohio State that good? Dwayne Haskins has looked phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Ohio State's been playing high school teams they the are. first two weeks yes. of the season, but they have been beating those high school teams very impressively. Um, special thanks for covering against Rutgers. Special Seriously. thanks to you yeah. for, for putting me on that game. That was a Kyle Bracky <laughs> special right there. Um, they lost Zamir White about three or four weeks ago to a second knee injury in a year, so another kid that you feel terrible for. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I said, with Oklahoma, same thing applies with Georgia. You know, they've got DeAndre Swift, obviously, is, the, is number one on the depth chart with James Cook and Elijah Holyfield behind him. Combined for 51 carries for 311 yards and four touchdowns through two games. And, the second, and un- unlike... Uh, Ohio State. Wait, how did that go from Ohio State to Georgia? What did I do there? You just kind of glossed over Ohio did I? State. Yeah. I feel bad because I do want to talk about Ohio State. Should I go back to Ohio State or should we just talk Georgia now? Let's talk Georgia. We'll, we'll get Ohio State in a second. Okay. I appreciate you helping yeah. me through that. So Georgia, uh, really good at football. Very good. <laughs> and also really loaded in the backfield. And those three dudes are really good. And I don't think anybody can beat Georgia because South Carolina was a team that I thought they were 10 and a half point dogs. I felt good about them. So good, in fact, that I led the cover four with it and looked really stupid, as has become tradition. Well, this, I think everyone kind of got suckered in by uh, 
I think South Carolina won like the last three or four in Columbia. And uh, I don't know. Maybe they just wanted to see an upset or they really thought, you know, last year's nine win South Carolina team. No, no, no. no. South Carolina had – here, I'll tell you – I'll take you through the thought process of a of, of, of incorrect better. Okay. Okay? Because I, I can speak from experience here. Um, I, I thought Jake Bentley would – provide more than what he did Mm -hmm. i understand the georgia defense is really good they also lost some pieces so i I wasn't sure we hadn't seen them yet um against an opponent of that caliber so i thought there may be some hiccups i thought jake bentley was the guy to take advantage of those hiccups i thought debo samuels the guy that that could potentially take advantage of that secondary in a few different ways um was very wrong about that that's not the case georgia Georgia actually looks better to me now than they looked at any point last year. Oh, absolutely. I Which totally agree. Which is crazy talk. Fromm just has continued to get better and his confidence is growing. And then they have more weapons on offense. Yeah, which is <laughs> I know insane. it's crazy. You lost Chubb and um, – Sonny Michelle. Sonny Michelle. My fantasy running back. Yeah, to, yeah, to the Patriots. <laughs> and uh, you get better yeah. on offense. Yeah, sure. Seems, so, seems logical. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and across the SEC, Alabama, I don't look, I, look. I'm sorry. I just feel like you can go ahead and pencil in Georgia and Alabama undefeated SEC championship. And I know that like it's college football; anything can happen. That's why they play the games. Blah 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 blah. I don't know how anybody can match the firepower of either of these teams. On Alabama, um, thinking back to like the Auburn game a year ago where they got beat, the offense sputtered pretty bad, and Jalen, who is a good player couldn't get them out of it because right. Jalen is kind of a one-dimensional quarterback. Absolutely. Doesn't bring a lot of vertical passing game. Pretty much, you know, a West Coast passer and a, and a runner first. And when you key on that, as Auburn was able to do with a defense like they've got, um, they were able to get Alabama out of out of their flow mm-hmm. and away from what they do. And that's how, you be, that's how you beat Bama. But you can't do that anymore because now they have two offenses. Like, I mean, it's Arkansas State. They literally ran two offenses. So you got Tua – who's going to light you up through the air, and then you've got Jalen, who's going to run the Alabama offense that um, doesn't suck, has yeah. gone to back-to-back national championships running that offense. Bama's always had super talented receivers, obviously, you know, Julio Jones and Amari Cooper and Calvin Ridley, but now they are on display more than ever with a quarterback like Tua who can get them the ball like never before. Yeah. It's funny to me because people are like, oh, the Alabama wide receiver room has never been better. Mm. I kind of like the receiver room that had Julio Jones in it. Right. But Julio Jones didn't have Tua throwing in the ball. Right. So, yeah, I mean, Tua's, Tua makes Alabama frighteningly good. Yeah, he's – I mean, there's no question about it. He's the best quarterback Nick Saban has ever had at Alabama. And it must be nice to be able to go from Tua to Jalen if you feel like it. Right. Throw so, out there for a series or two. Yeah, just score a couple touchdowns <laughs> yeah. a different way. Just give the defense a different look. Uh, okay, Ohio State. Sorry, guys. I didn't mean to just run away from you after I brought you up. Buckeyes look great. They do. And they've, you know, Dwayne Haskins has been incredibly efficient. What did you tell me his completion percentage it's was? It's like 73.9. Is that good? It's that good. Okay. Um, they got TCU this week. Mm-hmm. I believe game day is at TCU. They are. I don't believe TCU has a shot. And I told you that, and you disagreed with me earlier in the week, but I think you've come around. I did, yeah. When we were in the car ride back, I was like, "Eh, I don't know, Gary Patterson, he always has really good defenses. They always manage to give people problems, cause people headaches. Um, Dwayne Haskins is a better passer than JT Barrett ever was. Shots fired. Um, (laughs) And I know a lot of Ohio State fans that, like, watch that national championship game when – Saban put Tua in and was like, why have we not done this with Haskins? Yeah. Because he is better than JT Barrett. And that's showing these first couple games. Because last year, Ohio State couldn't throw the ball vertically. And this year, in like two games, Haskins has like eight touchdowns and uh, is obviously completing a ridiculous amount of his passes. And uh, also you factor in TCU starting a freshman quarterback who has beaten SMU and somebody other – like Southern or someone like that. Like I don't know. Week one, uh, and struggled they struggled with SMU early. Yeah, they were losing at halftime. I'm pretty sure. Uh, and that defensive line is a terror, led by Nick Bosa. Mm-hmm. Um, Bosa might be the best player in the country. He could be. Yeah, he's up there with like Ed Oliver. Yeah, yeah. I like, mean, no, well, no, no disrespect to Ed, right, or anybody else in college football. Nick yeah. Bosa 
is like a better version of Joey. Yeah. Um, so this one to me is like, now that I'm like looking at it more and thinking about it more, it's one that is close to like halftime. Maybe it's like a 14, 10 game at halftime or something like that. Then it kind of gets out of hand. We didn't even talk about Ohio State's running backs and J.K. Dobbins and Mike Weber. Please do. Um, well, yeah, there I mentioned them. Uh, <laughs> no, that's no they backs. are extremely good and can beat you if they need to, uh, if Haskins is struggling. Mm-hmm. Um, this one feels like one that gets out of hand uh, in the second half. The only program in the country that I can think of, and this includes Clemson, that has the firepower equivalent to what Oklahoma, Alabama, and Georgia have is Ohio State mm-hmm. in terms of skill players. Yeah. And I mean, I, look, Clemson's awesome, but Ohio State skill players on, are on another level. Right. And, you know, they too seem to, what'd you say, crap out? Yeah, crap out a new up. player, yeah. Was that what Saban actually said, or did yeah. he say the no, shit word? No, he said the shit word. Oh, God, Nick, come on, man. I didn't know if I was allowed to curse on this podcast. Yeah, bootleg's pretty free speaking, okay. man. We just kind of do what we want. The other no podcast no cares. really frowns upon that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, this is a new show for you, Bracky, so let your hair down. <laughs> uh, let's on that note. Let's actually hop into the cover four. Let's do it. Let's. Uh, I need you to channel your inner Shreveport Holiday Inn Let's 60 Hotel. Help the people make some money this week. All right. First, help me make some money this week. <laughs> first game up uh, that we have on the list here is KU getting or I'm sorry, giving three. Giving. I know it's weird. Kansas is giving points at home against Rutgers. Yes. And Rutgers is really bad. They're terrible. But you love KU. Why? A guy named Puka Williams. Uh, he did. I don't great know. Name, by I don't. The way. Yeah, great name. I don't know why he didn't play against Nichols the first week. Um, but then he played last week, and Central Michigan had no answer for him. And then I did some more research on him. He had like 130 yards, two touchdowns. But he is a four-star recruit from New Orleans, who had offers from LSU and Nebraska and a bunch of other schools, <laughs> Mississippi State, TCU, Arkansas, UCLA. Why did he go to Kansas? I don't know. Maybe he just likes the Plains. Maybe, I don't Maybe know. Maybe he loves college basketball. That has to be it. You know? Um, Off season, he wanted some stuff to do. Maybe. But that is... Not actual stuff, just other sports to watch because right. there's nothing to do in Lawrence. But right. you can go to basketball games all yeah, day. Yeah, he wanted to get free tickets to basketball games. Um, that He's the reason. I don't see Rutgers having an answer for that. Uh, first first road win since 2009. Shout out Kansas. Yeah. Um, let's keep it rolling. I Kansas, agree. Kansas with a winning record, getting three points at home. Rock chalk. Yeah. Let's go. All right. Next one up is Auburn giving nine and a half points to LSU. And I immediately told you this, and you this game terrifies me. I'm, yeah. I'm still scared. Yeah. But you had a great stat. Uh, yeah. So the last five ranked opponents that have gone into Jordan Hare have lost by an average of 26 points. That includes Alabama and Georgia last year. 26 is a lot more than nine and a half. That is. Um, uh, while they blew, while LSU blew out Miami, it was kind of a weird game. A lot of it had to do with turnovers. Mm-hmm. The LSU offense didn't do too much. I love Joe Burrow, but he hasn't been. He's been a game manager, honestly. The first two games, Southeastern Louisiana, they didn't light up the scoreboard last week. Mm. Um, and they are going to struggle to score against Auburn, and I'll take Auburn's offense over LSU's. Okay. I don't know about it. We'll see. We have, yeah. to, we'll have to talk this some one, more about this I know. one. Gonna have to, we're going to have to go off If I just sound confident right about it, the people, feel free to... Re- say, it with, say it emphatically. Yeah, people that's will right. believe you? Okay. Feel free to uh, rebu- uh, rebu- my point. No. Auburn minus nine and a half. Free money. <laughs> uh, Colorado State. Is getting 20 at Florida, and you love Colorado State. Oh, yeah, apparently I'm a big Colorado State guy now. Um, I We talked about these bets at the Holiday Inn, like you mentioned on Friday. <laughs> Wait, where were we? Holiday Inn, chilling with some Holiday of Holiday Inn should sponsor the show as they much should. as we've now mentioned them in the last like four minutes. Um, <clears throat> we had our conversation, Colby wrote the article, and then I was just doing more reading because we had time to kill. And I read about Colorado State, Arkansas, and how Arkansas secondary – was not very good, and that Colorado State was going to try to throw the ball all over the place, which uh, KJ Carr Samuels then did, mm-hmm. and they were getting 14 points. They cover that. Now you, they go to the swamp, Florida losing to Kentucky last week mm-hmm. and giving up big plays 
all over the field. Mm -hmm. All three Kentucky touchdowns came from 20 plus yards out. And uh, KJ Carr Samuels thrown for 1,100 yards, eight touchdowns, getting 20 points. Let's ride. Okay. KJ, free money. Let's Colorado State. Yeah. Getting 20. Right. Just keep picking Colorado State against the <laughs> SEC. That's the recipe yeah. for success here. Uh, Duke is getting six at Baylor. Yeah. This one, if um, Duke's quarterback, Daniel Jones, is healthy, Duke's the favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not. His clavicle is uh, broken, well, which is not well, good. Well, right. Well. But, uh, but there's good more. news. Okay, here it comes. Quentin Harris back has played in like 15 games in his career. He's been pretty good. Uh, the Duke rushing D is really good. And at games against Army and Northwestern, they only give up 260 rushing yards, which is very good against those teams. Uh, Baylor will struggle to run the ball. Um, and Duke will try to make Charlie Brewer beat him with – his arm and I think I don't know if they'll win but they're going to keep this within six okay uh this one I like army was good to me last week and they are minus six and a half at home against Hawaii who I like by the way I like Hawaii a lot but yeah. it's unreal travel for Hawaii coming all the way from the island from the big island to West Point New York yeah um you told me, uh, look, we we saw a football game being played at one o'clock in the morning last week. We did, but this game is going to be played at three a.m. in terms of what Hawaii players would their their biological clock would tell them. Right, it's a noon kickoff in uh, New York. So I, I just, I mean, if if Hawaii can come out and ball in this game, then we officially have to take Hawaii seriously. Yeah, not that Army's a world beater, but if you can, if you can. Army's a good team. They have a good defense. And if you can beat them on the road playing at 3 o'clock in the morning, more power to you. I just don't see it. I think Auburn um, – I think Hawaii comes out a little flat, rightfully so. I would come out flat too if I was playing at 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I just don't like it you for Hawaii You only have a week to prepare for that triple option too. Mm -hmm. And I don't know when they're leaving. They have to <laughs> – Today. I don't right, know. Right. <laughs> like, uh, good. Yeah, I agree. It's a good pick. Smart pick. Uh, I've got Oklahoma – giving 18 to Iowa State on this list because at some point I have to get on board with Oklahoma either I, I'm okay last week they didn't cover they only won by 28 the spread was 30 I ne and they were up by 35 yeah late. they I never yeah, believed that they the would touchdown was very late I didn't think that that would be the case it was um Kemp is banged up for Iowa State they're not sure mm -hmm. if he's going to play or not and Iowa State was Oklahoma's only loss a year ago so I feel like where normally when OU plays Ohio State, it's a problem of, of motivation. I see, we see that a lot. and we saw, mm -hmm. I mean, I, There's probably <clears throat> at least two or three times um, in a past decade where Iowa State snuck up on Oklahoma because they weren't really prepared for them. Um, that game historically has fallen a lot of times the week before Texas as well, which has been a problem. But with this, the, mo the, motiv the motivating factor of having lost to Iowa State a year ago and – the simple fact that this Oklahoma team is really, really good. Yes, I think that even at eighteen, it's one we have to we have to consider. They might be one of those teams all year where just bet them, no matter how <laughs> high the line is. I know uh, last year with the Patriots, one of the guys who works at a casino on Vegas is like, we can't set the line high enough. People just keep betting the Patriots, no matter how high we put it. And this like Oklahoma could be that team this year. Like no matter how high the line is, just bet them. Um, the last game I had on this list was West Virginia, North Carolina State, but um, moments before the show began. It has been canceled, and my heart hurts because <laughs> it's the first Saturday where I was going to be able to, like, sit down mm -hmm. and watch, like, the whole game and not be in a press box or, like, on my phone or something. And uh, it's Night. been taken from me. It's taken away. By Mother Nature. I, I think that you're lucky. I, you're not individually lucky but the West Virginia fan base as a whole and in particular your offense and the Heisman Trophy hopes of your quarterback potentially are lucky yes I agree because they tried to play one of these games a couple of years ago uh, right after a hurricane uh, with Notre Dame and NC State and the final score was like 3-0 and gross. NC State won and they should not have played the game it's just standing water everywhere and yeah it hurt Notre Dame moving forward and uh Yes, the 
air raid offense of Dana Holgerson would probably not fare very well in a hurricane. It'd be tough. So It'd be tough. I am if Will Greer can throw a ball <laughs> through a hurricane, then he needs to win the Heisman Give Trophy it to right, him right now. now. Give it to Cancel him right season. now. Okay, so I'm going to go off script then, and I'm going to add one in place of West Virginia. I like it. Uh, we talked about it right before we started the show, and that's Boise State mm-hmm. getting two and a half on the road at Stillwater against Oklahoma State. Yeah. I think we both like Boise State. Yes, I do. What is it about Boise in particular in a road environment that, that makes you comfortable with that spread? Uh, well, the quarterback helps, Brett Ripon. He's a three-year starter now. He's been there. He's done that. And I don't know. They just have that pedigree. They do that time and time again. They they go into these hostile environments. It started with uh, Chris Peterson, you know, and even before him. But they uh, – I don't know. I, and it's an Oklahoma State team that, I mean, who have they played? They played, like, Missouri State yeah, and Missouri South State. Alabama. Uh, give me Boise State, who's at least been on the road and played Troy. Mm-hmm. and Beat the hell out of Troy. They did. And then they beat the hell out of UConn last week, 62-7. to Yeah, I know. Um, so Which you were on that 30-point spread as well. Just I was. Let the record, Let the record I just, show. I get nervous about those big spreads. I when get nervous, too. When it's I didn't not, like it at all. I thought it was a terrible idea. When it's not Ohio State Rutgers. Um, I don't know. They just – it seems like one of those years where this Boise team, they get their Power 5 win mm-hmm. on the road at Oklahoma State, and then they cruise. Okay. All right. Boise cruising on the road at Stillwater. Why do you like it? Uh, for a lot of the reasons that you mentioned, I think that Brett Rippon is an excellent quarterback. I think that the the home field advantage in Stillwater is overstated. Uh is that the not, sooner homer not, no, coming No, I knew that was coming. As soon as I said <laughs> it, I knew that was coming. Nah, they just, um, I don't know. They, Oklahoma State fans are really loud when things are going well. When things are going poorly, they get very quiet. Mm-hmm. I think Boise will be able to score on their defense early, and I think that that you know, can potentially take the crowd out of it. I also think that Boise State defense is underrated. And like you said, I don't think the Oklahoma State offense has really been forced to show us who they really are. You know, Taylor Cornelius has looked good, but against who? So I, I don't know. I, I, I like Boise's team. I was really impressed with them at Troy because I think Troy is a good team, and they, they handled mm-hmm. them easily. Absolutely. Uh, UConn is a very bad team, but they didn't even give UConn a chance. Right. So I like that spot for them. I don't know that I like it enough to put it in the cover for, but yeah. I like it a lot. It's something that we'll have to talk about. Um, okay, another segment. Believe it or not. We're doing good. I know. This one is called Very Good Dog. And it's named in honor of our very good dogs. Yes. And it, I think right off the bat, I think you should go first. Because okay. I like yours a lot. I like mine a lot too, but go ahead. Um. So I don't know if you guys saw last week, but Florida State should have lost to Samford. Yeah. They gave I, up. I, I fell asleep. I, it was a little late for me, so yeah. I didn't see how it ended. But what I did see was pretty bad. I mean, they were losing with five minutes to go in the game. Well, first of all, Sanford's quarterback threw four interceptions, all in, all on Florida State's side of the 50. So just giving away points. Um, but defense, Sanford's defense still had a chance to end it. It was third and goal. Like five minutes ago, they're up by like four. Uh, they give up a touchdown with like two minutes to go. So they have plenty of time. They start driving down the field. They get on Florida State's side, pick six, mm-hmm. ball game. Ball game. Um, that does not bode well for a Florida State team that is going to go up to the Carrier Dome. Carrier Dome magic, man. That's right. Weird stuff happens in the Carrier yes. Dome. Yes. Uh, Clemson lost there last year. I recall. Uh, I believe the year before that, a top 15 Virginia Tech team went there and lost. Um, it's a weird place to play a football game. I don't know. It's very West Virginia used to have to go up there and play. Uh, and Eric Dungy's a baller. He is the a baller. Syracuse quarterback can beat you with his legs on the ground. Uh, I don't know. They didn't have an answer for Sanford. If Sanford's quarterback just stopped throwing the ball to them, they would not have won. <laughs> the, he was picking them apart uh, when he wasn't making terrible decisions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Eric, I don't see how they stop Eric Dungy. They're getting three and a half. Uh, I like him to win outright. There you go your very good dog yeah my very good dog is playing a program that is very near and dear to my heart mm-hmm. my very good dog for the week is north texas does this hurt to do this 
it would if I didn't love Mason Fine. Yeah. Uh, North Texas is getting six. I'm sorry, seven and a half points at Arkansas. Uh, Arkansas can't stop the pass. KJ Carter Samuels just threw for 389 mm-hmm. yards against that secondary. Yeah. Mason Fine has thrown for nearly 900 yards and seven <laughs> touchdowns in two games. I love Mason Fine against and you know Graham Harrell calling the plays against yes. that Arkansas secondary, and I think North Texas is a program that people are still trying to catch up to. I, I think that they're already one of the top Group of Five programs in the country. They just aren't being seen that way yet. They don't have the the outside perception that you know UCF or an FAU have, but personnel-wise, they have upgraded substantially in the last two years. Seth Luttrell has done a phenomenal job in that department, but also the way that he's coaching them up, their defense has been fantastic. Their offense has been as good as you'll find uh, among the Mm -hmm. group of five. And the progression of Mason Fine from freshman year to now is pretty incredible to watch. He's put on a lot of size. His arm strength has increased. Um, I actually talked to him in our hotel room yep. in the Holiday Inn, the Holiday Inn. Uh, and we t- and that's one of the things that he referenced was the fact that he's put on a lot of strength he feels more confident making the, the, the difficult throws from one hash to the far sideline and it's also in his backyard you know Mason Finals from Pegs Oklahoma he played at Locust Grove High School that's an hour at most from Fayetteville Arkansas didn't even almost recruit him so there's a little bit of that chip on your shoulder mm-hmm. thing which the kid does really well he maintains that chip on his shoulder even though he's a really nice guy, yeah, uh, he's able to channel that frustration in a positive way. Um, has so far throughout his career, so he's going to have you know 35, 40 people, friends and family in the stands of Fayetteville playing in front of a program that he grew up watching. I think the motivation there for him is massive. Yeah. So even just beyond the X's and O's, I love that part of it. And I mean, yeah, I, I don't. I mean, the best thing to come out of last week for Arkansas at Colorado State was that the Denver Post called them an SEC power, which is <laughs> like the first time in a very long time that anyone has called Arkansas a power. They're not. They're not that. This team is personnel-wise very bad. And while I'm on the subject, I would like to take this time to step upon my soapbox and deliver a message to my fellow Arkansas natives. Arkansasers? Yeah, that. This is not a Chad Morris thing. This is not... Uh, this is not... Craddock. This is not the chief. This is not a coaching situation here. This is a team that has the worst quarterback room in the Southeastern Conference. This is a team with a defense that was below average at best a year ago and lost pieces. They're not good. They, they always were going to be at best a four or five win team. This is not the sky is falling when you blow an 18 point lead to Colorado State. Yeah, that sucked. But this team already was not doing anything this year. So relax. Calm down. The only meaningful thing that's going to happen this season is going to happen on December 19th when Morris and his staff land the highest regarded recruiting class they've seen in a very long time, which they're on track to do. That is the only meaningful thing that's going to happen for Arkansas football in this calendar year. I'm sorry. (laughs) So, yeah, they lost to Colorado State, but get used to it because I think they're going to lose to North Texas. And I think they're going to lose a whole bunch more this year. And the games they win, they will, they will have won in spite of what they were left with from the coaching staff that departed. So, yeah, North Texas, plus I seven like and that. a half in Fayetteville. Um, I may have actually already bet that. Um, <laughs> but question. Yeah. If Colorado State beats Florida, mm-hmm. do they replace Tennessee in the SEC? They should. Okay. I think they, that, that should be yeah. something that – the SEC might want to look into. It could be. Uh, we'll, we'll say – we won't say Tennessee yet. We'll just say the last placing SEC team. I think it's going to be the one I just talked about. Really? You yeah, think? But, yeah, but I can't let you go there. You can't have Arkansas spot in the SEC. I just think – I think Tennessee is worse than Arkansas. But we'll f- – I guess – I think the Arkansas staff gives them a fighting chance to steal a couple. I think that – Within the SEC West, maybe Ole Miss is a game they might circle on their calendar as, as being one that's there for the taking. I think Vanderbilt at home at the end of October is, is a game they yep. can win. Um, are they more talented than North Texas? Yeah, they are. But I just think for all the reasons I mentioned, the intangible yeah. the intangible 
uh, kind of swagger that North Texas has going into Fayetteville. I don't know. I, I just I like North Texas in this one, but I I don't. It's not the end of the world for Arkansas. No, I agree. Got to build. Okay. Uh, I don't have a clever name for this particular portion of the show, but we're going to talk about the NFL. Let's do it. Uh, and I don't really want to talk about the NFL, if I'm being totally honest. <laughs> I really wanted to leave this part off because the Cowboys game on Sunday put me in a really shitty funk for like two full days. I guess, what, what am I now, like 37 hours removed from it's that game? It's not even two full days yet. I okay, think, well, yeah. I'm still there. I'm still not. I'm, 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 in a, I'm in a dark place. I'm not even able to really to talk about my Cowboys I don't know what that was that I watched on Sunday, but I'm going to need Linehan to improve. I don't know any other way to put it. Like, I, I don't know what they're doing offensively. I don't know how Zeke Elliott can only get 15 carries in an eight-point game. I, nothing that I saw offensively made any sense at all. They, they went out and got Deontay Thompson and Tavon Austin to add speed, but they're not doing anything with the speed. Yeah. They're they're frequently lining up with two tight in in four wide receiver sets, which is anti speed. And Dak was really inaccurate on m- several different occasions. Partially maybe because he's trying to throw the ball to Blake Jarwin instead of Deontay Thompson or Alan Hearns. I don't even know why they signed Alan Hearns. I don't even know where he was on Sunday. I don't know where Cole Beasley was, and Beasley ought to be the one that's like the security blanket for Dak. Usually so I, he is, yeah. So I, I don't know. Nothing I saw offensively for them made any sense. The defense looked really good. So that's that's my glass half full take on the Cowboys is go defense. Also, what the heck? Why'd they cut Dan Bailey? I don't know. But it was so prophetic that Maher would – Mayor? Ma, whatever your name. Yeah. You got to make a field goal before I know how to <laughs> that's right. pronounce your name. Uh, it was so – it was so prophetic that he would come out and miss a field goal mm-hmm. that that Dan the man would have definitely drilled. Yeah. So I don't know, man. The Cowboys, I, they're confusing me from a coaching uh, standpoint. Their front office has confused me a lot in the last two weeks with stuff like the Dan Bailey being cut part, Travis Frederick being out, obviously beyond their control. And I'm sure that, not help. that probably – there were some issues on the offensive line that were probably in large part due to Frederick not being there. But Connor Williams was not good at guard, did mm-hmm. not grade out well. Tyron Smith had a hold and a block in the back within like three or four plays of one another. He's supposed to be the best tackle in football. So, I don't know. I came in this season really optimistic about the Cowboys, mm-hmm. which always scares me, and now I'm really hating myself for it <laughs> because um, I'm kind of down in the dumps. It's a long season. But I do want you to have the opportunity to talk about your Packers because my favorite part of Sunday – was following along with your wife Olivia's live tweeting of your emotional roller coaster. So please yeah. tell us, take us back, and take us through your Sunday night watching the pack. So I, like you, had very high expectations going into this year. Green Bay finally made changes to the front office, which I was very happy with. Also, I should probably tell everyone I'm an owner. Um, it is the okay. only publicly owned team Uh Technically, mm-hmm. but I have stock. Okay, and I get invites to the owners' meetings. Throwing your year. weight around a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I was happy. We finally made some changes to the front office. Mm-hmm. You know, my complaints finally got through. Uh, <laughs> although McCarthy is not gone yet, but give it some time. Um, we got a new offense coordinator, new defense coordinator, which they had made changes in like ten plus years, which is unheard of in the NFL. Um, so I was happy about that. So it came in very optimistic. Uh, three and out, punt. Yeah. First time on the field for Aaron Rodgers, and then Chicago is lining up tackles at wide receiver, and we look like we are playing a different sport on defense. <laughs> and they go down the field and score. Mitch Trubisky has a rushing touchdown, and I'm like, what in the heck is going on? So we're down seven nothing. I stay really calm, and then <laughs> do you? Okay. Yeah, no, I really was. Okay. Usually I'm screaming, I'm throwing things. I think Katie was ready to divorce me during the Cowboys <laughs> game, so I'm glad to hear that. Usually I'm like that, and Olivia does not appreciate it, but I was very calm. <laughs> I'm going to take it, you know, first first possession of each series, and then it just got worse. Uh, I thought Cleo Mack was only supposed to play like 15 plays. He's out there every single play, Yeah. and he is in Aaron Rodgers' face every single play, and uh, we can't get the run game going, and then – the dude falls on Aaron and 
The season flashes before my eyes for the second year in a row. I thought he was done. I did too. Off on the cart. Al Michaels like writing his eulogy for yeah. him as he as he's carted off the field. So at first I was like, okay, he kind of stood up, and I was like, okay, he's all right. Like he was just a little slow, and then he just like fell back down. Dropped to his yeah, knees. Yeah, and I was like, oh, my, he's done. And, he's and the done. fate of the Packers dropped with him. Yes, because you know who the backup quarterback is. I do. Deshaun Kaiser, which I think he's an upgrade over Hundley. In the slight. F- slight, right. The and only, I don't know how much that's saying. The only thing that Hunley has like over him is he would just not throw the ball. <laughs> Kaiser would just throws the ball and gets intercepted. Uh-huh. Hunley at least like gives you a chance to punt. Okay. But also McCarthy didn't trust him to throw the ball more than five yards down the field. Right. Um so anyways, I'm legit I wasn't mad. I was depressed. He did execute a really nice handoff to Khalil Mack. To Khalil Mack and yeah. then a pass to him. He True, hit him, yeah. He hit him with a pass, too. So he's really good at getting the ball to Khalil Mack. Yeah, yeah. So if we could just get Khalil Mack, we'd be great. <laughs> but so I was depressed. Usually I'm mad. I was depressed. <laughs> I literally, like, I was laying there on the couch, and I just had the pillow over my face. And I, I canceled the season. Did you see that? I did. You I canceled it. I know. So the, there was a while where the NFL was off for the year. <laughs> I canceled the season. And then I hear, well, Colby tried to scare me, too. He's like, dude, I don't want to be the one to break this to you, but... I got tricked. He's like, he has partially a, torn it was, ACL. Like it was he's a fake done. Ian Rappaport Twitter yeah. account. He got me. He, he got, got me. got So then I hear he's playing the second half, and I'd, like, gone to the other room to hang out with Olivia, and she's like, just stay in here. Don't even watch. I was like, no, I have to watch. Like, I can't not watch. So we kick a field goal. I was like... Whatever. Chicago took like seven minutes off the clock that first drive. I was like, there's not enough time. Then we get stops. We He throws a dime. On one leg. To Geronimo Allison, who you loved, by the way. I do love Geronimo. Fantasy sleeper. And then another stop, another touchdown. And then, thanks to some really bad play calling by Chicago, we get a chance. Third and one, we hadn't been able to stop them all game. And they throw the ball. Instead of running it, when we didn't have any timeouts up, they took a page out of McGill Tulin's playbook. Because <laughs> I, I was like, they're gonna run it right here. They're gonna run it right here. They're gonna get the first down, and they're just gonna they're just gonna take a knee. Yeah, and it's over. Yeah, and they try to throw the ball. So thank you, uh, Matt Nagy, for outsmarting yourself, um, which gives Aaron Rodgers a chance. And he was he was, I knew it was over when he was laughing on the sidelines with McCarthy before he even went out there down six, and it's like. Pfft. I mean, he did it to the Cowboys last year, too. Oh, sorry. thanks for that. Sorry. Really? I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. <laughs> um, but I, so I just felt really confident. I didn't expect it to be a 75-yard touchdown pass. No, that was cool. It was very cool. It was very dramatic. Like, Randall Cobb just weaving in and out of corners. Yeah, and, you know, I don't know if Randall knows this, but you were on him. I was. You were saying that the 18 better of, step it up. A lot of Packers fans were, and I think – uh, for a large portion of this off season, I think a lot of people thought they were going to release him, and they ended up not. I wish they would have. And, and apparently, we could use. Some <laughs> yeah, help. seriously. Um, so thank God we didn't do that, uh, because he was like 140 yards receiving. He was huge. Mm-hmm. Um, and then all was right in the world, and ba- football was back on. Back on. It's back on. So we're very, we're all very fortunate that the Packers won, so that we can I actually was, watch football for the rest of the year. Yes, you're lucky. Okay. I was in a dark place like you were, and I would be in that mood uh-huh. that you are in if it was not for Aaron Rodgers being uh, immortal. I don't know what you call him. He's incredible. He's a robot. Yeah. Yeah. He's like the Terminator movie. He's a character from that. Like you can't. Right. He's. The best passer in the league, I won't say quarterback because I respect Tom Brady very much. Mm, I respect Tom Brady too, but, but I think if Aaron Rodgers played in that New England offense for the stretch of time that Tom Brady has played in that New England offense, I think he, I think the narrative is different. There's many times way. where I'm very frustrated. I'm very flustered with the Packers offense because we don't open up enough. No? No. Not at all. We had to. We literally well, had to. Bracky, because listen, as, a, as losing an Losing 20 to 0. It's on you. To make the moves needed I, to make that happen, I try. You gotta voice your opinion in those out there's board meetings. Literally, like thousands of other owners, but you just gotta yell louder. <laughs> I know, I know. The only thing that saved me on Sunday, and it was a very, it was a small thing, but the Chiefs were awesome, uh, and I love that for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, Pat Mahomes is my fantasy quarterback. <laughs> 
and I'm brilliant for drafting him. You are. So there's that. Again, another shout out to me. Uh, also, I lived in Kansas City for two years. Mm-hmm. Grew up. It's a great shirt. Yeah, go Roos. Um, living in Kansas City for two years afforded me the opportunity to witness the Chiefs fan base live and in color. Mm-hmm. And they're the most miserable bunch of people <laughs> that I've ever watched football with. Okay. They're all just drunk and angry, even in victory, and kind of insufferable, honestly. And so for them to have a team, I don't think they could possibly complain about. It did my heart good because now I know that the pubs in Westport and Country Club Plaza and the Power and Light District – are a far nicer place to be. <laughs> and so for my for my Kansas City brethren, I was happy to see that. And, you know, I mean, my driver's license does still say that I live at 722 Ward Parkway in Kansas City. So I think that I have a license to cheer for the Chiefs. No, absolutely. Uh, in light of what's happening in Dallas. So that's, that's what <clears throat> I'm going to do. I'm just going to really enjoy my homes to Tyreek Hill and hope that he'll maybe mix in a few passes you know to how, Sammy Watkins. You know how... The Chiefs use Tyreek Hill. Yeah, every which way. Right. That is how the Cowboys should use Tavon Austin and how every coach in the NFL should have used Tavon Austin. It has been a crime how he has been handled. Oh, wow. I forgot about the Tavon West Virginia thing. Here we yeah. go. Yeah. I, 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 it's it's ridiculous. They didn't let him They didn't let him return kicks in, in L.A. Uh-huh. Or St. Louis before they yeah. moved. He muffed a few punts, though. That's how Farrell right. Cooper ended up with the job. He's also taken a few to the house, which uh, <laughs> has Farrell Cooper done that? Okay. Um, but seriously, that is how you use someone with the, that kind of skill set. Did you see the little touch pass last night from Goff to Gurley? I did. That's a Dana Holgerson special. We were running that on Clemson. We were hanging 70 on him in 2012. Okay. That is, that is how your Cowboys should be using him. Listen, preaching to the choir. Couldn't agree more. I don't know what the point of bringing Tavon in was if you're just going to line him up at wide receiver and run the occasional jet sweep. Which, by the way, is there a play in the NFL that sucks more than the jet sweep? I don't know if there's a play more in football besides a fade that sucks more than the jet sweep. It literally never works. Yeah. I don't remember the last time that I saw a team run the jet sweep and you were like, oh, shit, take it to the house. Let's go. It's always a loss of five. Or they make eight guys miss behind the line of scrimmage and they get forward for two yards. Right. It's so stupid. I I hate that play with my whole heart. And apparently that was the only reason we brought in Tavon. So that's really exciting. It's sad. I feel for the guy. Yeah. Go Chiefs. <laughs> um, that was way more than I actually thought that I would be able to stomach talking about the NFL. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to speak to NFL related? Uh, how awesome was the Browns-Steelers game? That was fun. The last because it was just like it was kind of gross, but it, it was, was gro- also but it like was like perfect, fun, perfect Browns. Football. Right, it was fun in like the gross way because so I went to school in Ohio and I grew up uh, with a lot of Browns fans and obviously at Ohio there are a ton of Cleveland people. Mm-hmm. They are the most loyal bunch of fans you will ever meet in your entire life, and you want the Browns to be good for them. Like they they love them so much. And they care so much. And they, they are optimistic. For as bad as they are, they are optimistic. And, uh, you know, watching Hard Knocks, you get sucked into, mm-hmm. you know, whatever team that is that year. Yeah. And uh, it's a crazy stat. It's like, so a team that in the NFL has forced five turnovers, and I don't know how many years this covers, but they are like 130 and two and one when you force five turnovers, the teams that force the five turnovers. Okay. That seems good. Yeah. The Browns have the two losses and the one tie now. Ouch. Right. But they got the tie. They got the tie. They didn't lose. They did not lose. They did not lose. Best start since 2004. And, uh, I'm, I'm a Steelers hater, so I was cheering really hard against them. Oh, okay. Uh, so that was – I. it was electric, you know, because it was like, are they going to do it? Is this, is this the drive? They do it. And they kept picking off Roethlisberger <laughs> and then not doing anything with Tyrod would give it back. When are they going to free Baker? Free it's, Baker. Tyrod, he's, he's all right. He's average. Let, let, let Baker go. You know who else was cheering against Pittsburgh on Sunday? You? Le'Veon Bell. Yes, he was. Because uh, <clears throat> any leverage that he might have had prior to Sunday, mm-hmm. James Conner took away. Yeah. James yeah. Conner was a 
beast yeah. on Sunday. I would know that firsthand because I played against him in fantasy. Mm. And literally, he, had, he single-handedly. He did have him. the one costly fumble. Uh, but you know, he had a fumble. He had two around. touchdowns, 130 yards, I think. Yeah. Um, I feel like Le'Veon's then, never fumbled. Le'Veon's out there subtweeting. Yeah. It's like the I. Yeah. Get to work. Does. You're making millions. Get to work. <laughs> Uh, all right. If uh, if you're really jealous that you missed out on Nicobe Dean or Jace McClellan or the Miracle on the Border, um, all the replays are available at flowfootball.com. If D2 college football is your thing, God bless you. And also, we have some SEAC <laughs> football on the website this week and on the Flow Sports app. Uh, Fort Valley State will take on Miles College. I will be in Oklahoma City. Oh. Friday night at uh, I'll be watching defensive end Ethan Ridenauer, my cousin. Okay. At defending state champion Carl Albert, they'll be taking on Shawnee, so that's where I'll be. Where will awesome. you be? I'll be here in Austin. Um, I don't know what I'll be doing. This not week. watching be, West Virginia. Not watching West Virginia. I will be watching a ton of college football, and uh, I will have it locked on the red zone on Sunday for seven hours of commercial free football. There you go. Um, <laughs> it's a little plug to the yeah. NFL Network. Shout out Scott Hansen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I'd be watching football. All right, cool. Well, uh, we'll be back here in the same spot next week. Oh. I do know that, mm-hmm. and we'll do some more of this. So hopefully the Cowboys win, and Aaron Rodgers doesn't die, and we're all happy. <laughs>